All right, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Lord. Welcome to Transformation Ministry. I'm Pastor Anthony L. Walker coming to you. Uh, we're located at 115 Cothy Avenue in Fayetteville, Georgia. And you're always invited to join us in service here at 115 Cothy Avenue in Fayetteville, Georgia, every Saturday at noon. And if uh, you don't mind driving to Fayetteville, then you're welcome to drive and you know, sit a spell and fellowship with us, have some refreshments after service, uh, have some Q&A time after service. You know, so we like to don't want to just send you empty-handed. And we want to fill your bellies and hopefully uh, fill your heart, fill your mind all at the same time. And I always like to make mention of Transformation Ministries webpage, which is tm-church.com. Uh, please check us out from time to time and see what's happening here at Transformation Ministries. You can get the updates on the FYI menu as to the, the previous messages that have been recent. And then you can go to the Box of Chocolate pages to see uh, what I may have in store for that. You never know what you're going to get. But i tell you what you're going to get if you go this month. That's continuing from last month. And I have my Salvation Series uh, God's salvation series, but the messages that I put out there um, regarding the salvation, God's plan of salvation, uh, the repentance, the baptism, uh, the Holy Spirit, and also the, the last message out there is walking away salvation, the consequences of doing so. So I just wanted to plug that out there for you. And as always, I like to let people know, especially if you're tuning in for the first time, that Transformation Ministry is a teaching ministry. We want you to, to know. We want to give you information. We want to give you instructions. We want to give you words of wisdom to live by, with basically the Word of God. And uh, people perish for a lack of knowledge. So we want you to have knowledge along with understanding. And there's three things that we want you to receive from the messages and the services here at Transformation Ministry. And that is what the Bible says and then also what the Bible means. Because people can say, hey, the Bible says this, but we want you to know what it means. And then we also want you to have the wisdom to know how to apply what that knowledge that you received and now understand. And that you have the wisdom to apply it to your life. So before we get into the message, let's have a word of prayer to pray for the service and the message. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for being mindful of us, Lord God. We thank you for your presence with us. Lord God, thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We ask that today's message, this message that we have titled um, Outnumbered, that it may touch the heart and mind of those who are hearing, that it be an encouragement and a motivation to those who hear, Lord God, to, uh, to keep the faith, Lord God, no matter who's with you and no matter who's not with you, Lord God, that you will continue to walk in the word and that, that we will continue to walk in your word, Lord God. And Father God, we love you and we adore you and, and bless your holy name. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Sometimes I get tongue-tied <laughs> and I'm excited about, you know, the, the message that God gave me. Uh, my wife and I was having a discussion about um, uh, a week or so ago about uh, just how sometimes it seems like we're all into this by ourselves and certain things, you know, in life, not just uh, this ministry. And we feel outnumbered. And that's why I came up with today's message, outnumbered. <clears throat> so I hope that you will be able to um, relate to this, you know, and that you're on the side. Uh, and then when I say outnumbered, I'm looking at perspective of that we're on God's side. You know, because the world at large is not on God's side. So let's start off with the definition for outnumbered. <clears throat> we define uh, outnumbered by this. It says to be greater in number than someone or something. So if um, there is something that is greater in number than, than, than you, or, or greater in number than God, or the ways of God. I didn't say greater than God. Mm -hmm. I said greater in number. And we already know that that the majority of people in this world are not going to make it to heaven, even though the world don't, don't think so or act like that's not so. The majority of the people who come through life is not going to be with God at the end, at the end of this life. And so you want to make sure that you are in this number. 
You know, when the saints go marching in, you want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. All right, so have you ever, have you ever uh, meditated on a situation <clears throat> in your life and felt like that uh, it was you against the world? I know I have. And on many occasions, I felt like it was me against the world. And I'm pretty sure that I am not the only one who has felt that way. So I'm reminded of David's word in Psalms uh, 139, verse 18. It says, if I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. So David compares God's thoughts. If you go to the previous uh, verse, which is <clears throat> verse 17, uh, it's talking about the thoughts, God thoughts. And so it continues in verse 18. And so it's David comparing God's thoughts to the grains of sand, numerous and beyond a person's ability to count. And so David states that when he awakes, he is still with God. He meditates on God during the night and during his waking hours. <clears throat> and I thought about that. When I read the scripture and was and was just meditating on the word and pondering what it made me, what I think it means, and I just made me think about, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm I'm thinking about God, I'm thanking God first thing, putting my feet on the floor. I thank God for waking me up, and so waking up in the morning with your first thought on God is very comforting. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that, then start doing it. You'll see, it's comforting. You say, thank you, Lord God, for waking me this morning. And so whenever I begin to wonder, or I begin to doubt, or I begin to even worry, you know, I try not to worry that much at all. Because, but if I begin to do that, I take the prayer, I take time to pray, and I go to the scriptures. And when I do that, it, is, um, it, is, it lets me know or reminds me that God is in control. No matter what may seem out of control in our life, we look at God's promise to us and we realize that God is still in control. So I trust God to see me through every situation. No matter the circumstance, I, I know that God will see me through. And when I start focusing on my ways, because a lot of times we do that, and that's where depression set in. You know, when you, you're thinking about everything that could go wrong or something that may have gone wrong, and you're pondering on that, and your every thought is that, you need to take your focus off that and put it on God. Mm -hmm. And God will get you through. Mm -hmm. And then you realize um, in the outcome that God's way was always the better way. Mm -hmm. There's been times where I just felt down, and I just felt like depression was trying to come over me, and, and I just tried this one day. I'm going to focus on God. And how do I do that? Take the focus off me and just put the praise on God. And I will begin, and I've said this in messages before, that I would just start shouting, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you try sometimes, you're feeling bad, just go, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I ain't just saying a couple of times, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hey, it didn't work. I'm talking about hallelujah, hallelujah. You're just praising God. I mean, even if it brings you to tears, and sometimes it will. Not tears of sadness, but tears of joy because that weight is lifted because your focus is now on God and not on yourself. Amen. And it works. If you don't believe me, give it a try. And just, just keep praising him until something happens. And something will happen. Because you're going to realize, hey, I'm, I'm praising God. I don't forget about my trouble. It works for me. I just say that. Try it for yourself. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways or your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I mean, God knows something that you don't know. And I remember seeing a cartoon once where there was this mountainside. You ever been to the West Coast? And they have those mountains, and then you got the roads that are going around the mountain. Mm -hmm. And then there might be a traffic jam or something, and you don't know what's going around that mountain. But then the guy's up in the, the news guy's in the helicopter, and he's flying up high. And he can see what's happening on that side because you can't see around the mountain. And you may get discouraged and maybe even turn around and go the other way when the helicopter can see that on that end, 
the the little uh, debris or whatever's in the road is being cleaned up, and now the road's about to continue. But because you're looking at your thoughts and your ways or what you can see uh, and how you assess the situation, you may just go ahead and turn around and go back and not go to your destination where you were planning on going. And see, God sits high and looks low. He His ways are higher than our ways. He can see things and know things that we don't know. So that's why we have to trust in him. Especially if you believe that God has sent you on a, on a journey to a destination, you don't turn around for nothing, no matter what you come up against. Um, you Even if everybody else is turning around, everybody else, you're the only one going to go this way. I've seen cartoons where they show someone digging um, for treasure or something, and then they just get to where they're going to just they're going to give up. And then just five more feet, there was the pile of gold or the diamonds or whatever because they don't gave up. But when God did not tell them to give up, God just told them what to do. And so you got to do it. You got to do it. If you need encouragement, pray. Pray without ceasing and let, let God comfort you with his word. And so many times in life, you will come up against people who do not revere the Lord as you do. And so, in fact, the majority of the people are, are not God-fearing people. There are people who might say they are, but they're not God-fearing people, and you can tell by their actions, by what they do. Now, people might say one thing and, and, and do something totally different. But these type of people are going to outnumber you. Mm -hmm. And this is why I sometimes feel as though it is me up against the world. And so I, too, see, a lot of times feel like I'm outnumbered. I'm like, am I the only way who think the way I, I think? Am I the only way feeling the way I, I'm feeling? Am I the only way who is doing what, am I the only person doing what God called me to do? Of course not. But sometimes you feel that way because no one is in your corner. No one is really supporting you in what you, what you know that God called you to do. God called you. He didn't call them. I mean, who not God's calling different people to do various things, but not everybody's going to heed to that, take heed to that call. But if God calls you, then no matter if nobody else follow, then you're going to do it. We were singing a song uh, prior to this, the, the message, I have decided to follow Jesus. And you say that no turning back. Even if you wonder, there's no turning back. If nobody else follow you, there's no turning back. No turning back. We had a good time singing it. But, you know, so people are going to outnumber you. And like I say, it's, you feel like it's you against the world. The world is my enemy because the world is the enemy of God. And an enemy of God is an enemy of mine also. Yeah, you know, what kind of pastor are you saying that the world is your enemy? Like I just said, the world is my enemy because the world is an enemy of God. Is everybody? No, not everybody. But the majority, yes. And people are deceived if they think that this world we live in is not wicked. If we think that this world um, doesn't revere God, it does not. If you look at what goes on in the world and what the world accepts and what the world promotes and what the world celebrates, it's not of God. And so if you desire that to be to, to go along with the status quo, to be in that number to follow the Lord, then you're not following Christ. And so if, if you're a buddy, buddy, if you're a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of Pastor Anthony Walker. Do I hate you? No, I don't hate you. I love you. Does God hate you? No, God loves you. Amen. Because, you know, these same people who... I, I, I say this thing because I read it a long time ago. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. You know, so a lot of times, well, I'm not a lot of times, every time we have all been sinners. And then when we come to Christ, then now we're a saint. Not that we're always a saint. Like I say in that song we were singing, sometimes I wonder, but I still follow. Sometimes we're going to miss the mark, but still we repent and we follow Christ. <clears throat> when I talked about the, the, 
the world being the enemy of God. Let's look at James chapter 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye that, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So when I say these things what I, that I said earlier, I'm not just saying it because, hey, I felt like saying it. I'm saying it because it's in Scripture. This is what James wrote. A friend of the world is someone more concerned with following the standards of the world rather than the standards of God. It is a compromise with the values and the method of fallen humanity. When we live according to the earthly desires, a lot of times we want to keep up with the, the, the Joneses. Sometimes we want to uh, do what the celebrities are doing. We want to do what the entertainers are doing. We want to do what the people in power, we want to relate to them. But when we have those desires, we have become a friend of the world and therefore an uh, enemy of God. To be friends with the world, <clears throat> to be friends with the world is... Uh, going along with the world and the world standards, agreeing with the world, um, and to and loving the lusts and desires of this world. Uh, your sinful human nature is to please self. To please self and to please self. You cannot do that and be a friend of God. You can't be selfish and just only thinking about yourself and, and, and think that you are a friend of God. Therefore, you are an enemy of God. An enemy is someone who resists you, who contradicts you, who crosses you. An enemy is, uh, in this context, is someone who resists God, uh, who ignores God, who disobeys God. Those are enemies of God. He, if you disobey the, the laws of God, the, the commands of God, the scriptures, then you're not in the will of God. If you are apart from Jesus Christ, you are an enemy of God. However, the amazing thing is that even while you were God's enemy, you were reconciled to him through the death of Jesus Christ. And a lot of us have just uh, finished observing and celebrating Christ's resurrection. You know, Christ did that so that we can be reconciled with God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And we were singing this song, um, uh, this song before the message, another song, and it says, Your life saved my life. So Christ's life saved my life. And so we won't, we, we just sing a lot of songs that God makes me happy because his life saved my life. As a friend of God, you are not to be afraid of your enemies. You know, there's times where you might fear. And God says, fear not. You know, we, we are not to fear our enemy. Our enemy should fear us, should fear God. Instead, be strong in faith. Your victory depends on it. God has shown you time and time again that he loves you and that he will guide you and he will protect you. And I, I, I you know, sometimes when you're talking to people, they're always whining about something. And um, you remind them, hey, remember last year when you was complaining and whining about a similar matter? Oh, but this time is different, not this time. No, you said that two years ago. <laughs> and then you said it again probably four years ago. So is it you got to remember that God will continue to to care for you, continue to love you, but you gotta you gotta hold on to that. Remember that. Quit being a whine, a, a whiner. <laughs> you know, you talk about these testimonies. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, how to you know God speak to us, how God encourage us, and it's through His Word. And then I say it's always through our words, through our testimonies. And sometimes you have to go through a test. And some people, they forget all that and all they have, all they remember are the monies. <laughs> so we, got, we have a testimony for a reason. 
to encourage someone else. We got to continue to hold on to God's promise, to his presence, and to his power. Uh, the priest reminded Israel to be encouraged and not to be afraid of their enemies based on God's power and faithfulness that was shown to them when he brought them out of Egypt. Again, you know, we just passed the resurrection observances and they talked that there's Ten Commandments was on TV every year and it talks about God bringing the people out of Egypt, out of bondage. And so the priests had to continue to um, encourage the people. We look at Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1 through 4. And it says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seeth horses and chariots and a people more than you thou, be not afraid of them. These people are looking at people who outnumber them. Mm -hmm. Be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out the land of Egypt. And it shall be when ye are come nigh unto battle, unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. See, the God, God has your back. If you're one of his, he's going to take care of you. He's going to defend you. He's going to fight for you. When God is on your side, as a result of you being on God's side, um, you may be outnumbered, but you are definitely not outdone. <laughs> and I'm going to talk to you a story, tell you a story. Remember the story of Gideon. God called Gideon to defeat the Midianites. The Midianites. And we look at the book of Judges. So I'm going to read some, some scripture from Judges. In chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian seven years. At the hand, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because they were disobedient. To God. They, they did evil before God, and this was their punishment. They put themselves in the, these situations. Sometimes when we go against God, then there's consequences behind what we do. And so, you know, you can, you, you when you commit a certain sin or, or sins or, or evil acts, there's consequences behind those things. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, it's continued to say, and because of the Midianites the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Now we fast forward a bit to first verse 7. It says, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. So Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord heard them. Sometimes people wonder, why don't we have a move of God like we read about in the Bible? Because we're not crying out to God like they did in the Bible. Mm -hmm. No, we, we want to go to our uh, psychoanalyst or uh, turn on the talk or the view or, or listen to what the celebs have to say. Right dear Abby and Ann Landers and all, I don't know if they still around, but anyway, we'll seek advice from everyone except from God. So we're going to fast forward a bit more to verse 12 and 14. So let's look at Judges chapter 6, verse 12 and 14, 12 through 14. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. This is God talking to, I mean, the angel talking to Gideon. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befalling us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us. And this reminds me of the people that I speak to who always, Woe is me, the Lord has forsaken me. You know, but it, it's, it's because we forget 
all the great things that God uh, did for has done for us. Mm -hmm. And so people, the, even the Israelites, when they were led out of Egypt, all they did was murmur and complain. Oh, yeah. God provided them food, provided them water, and then they're still, I mean, God got them out of, out of Egypt, I mean, out of Egypt. And so taking them to the land of, on the way, the journey to land of milk and honey, uh, but because they kept murmuring and complaining, and that's what happened with us, with, with, with mankind today. We murmur and complain when things don't happen the way we want them to happen, instead of being faithful and trusting God. So let me continue. Uh, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. That's because they did evil unto the Lord. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? So, the story of Gideon and Gideon's army. I'm going to paraphrase what all the scripture says, so I just kind of paraphrase it on paper so I can deliver that to you um, just to summarize the story of Gideon. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give um, the Midianites into their hands. So God had Gideon to reduce the size of the army. The army was not going to take all the credit for defeating the Midianites. So God wasn't going to let uh, a large army of Gideon to go in up, up against the Midianites. God's plan is to deliver them from the Midianites. So he, wanted, he did not want them to have a large army, and they defeat them, and they said, look what we did. Uh, he, he wanted to reduce that size so he can show them what God is doing. God, a lot of time, takes something of lesser to create, to defeat something that but it's supposed to be greater. And that's why he, he uh, manifested himself a little lower than the angels. When Jesus came as a man, you know, little lower than the angels. And it took, you know, Satan was an angel. Yeah. And so it took man to defeat Satan, mm -hmm. something that was little lower than him. And so that's what God does. He's going to, he doesn't look at the, um, the size of, the people or the army, uh, he look at the, himself in in you know fighting on your behalf. I said that he will fight for you on your behalf. So God had Gideon to reduce the size of the army. The army was not going to take the credit for defeating the Midianites. Uh, so to reduce the number of men, uh, those who were fearful, fearful, God sent them home. You know, if though if he Gideon said to them. You know, if, if you feel like, hey, you, you, we can't win this battle, if you're afraid, hey, by your leave, you may go home. <laughs> and so so after this reduction, the army was stooped to a stream to drink, upon their knees to, to drink. Then God said, those are the ones that he have to let go. But there were 300 men who drank from the water by cupping their hand to drink to drink the water that way. They Some might say that they let knelt down like a dog, you know, on their knees to, to lap the water from the from the stream. But God said, hey, those who cut their hands and brought the water to them, those are the ones Thank that you. we're going to keep, and they number 300. <clears throat> so, though greatly the camp of and that night God told Gideon, get up and go down into the camp of the Midian and I will give them to you. And so Gideon and his armor bearer, just those two, they went down near the place where the sentries were posted. And so they kind of infiltrated there and did a little reconnaissance. And they were, he were, they were among them. And Gideon arrived just in time to hear the men, uh, to hear a man tell a story to uh, one of his friends about a dream that he had. He said that I had this dream that a loaf of barley, uh, barley bread, tumbled down into the Midian camp and it came to a tent and hit it so hard that the tent collapsed. You know, some people think that every dream has a meaning. Mm -hmm. So his friend said, this has to be the sword of Gideon, the Israelites. God has turned Midian, the whole camp, over to him. And when Gideon heard the, the telling of this dream, uh, his interpretation and the interpretation with it, 
he began to worship God after hearing that. And he returned to the Israelite camp and he said, Arise, the Lord has delivered into your hand the host of Midian. You know, I, I remember when uh, Joshua uh, marched around Jericho, God said in the scriptures, I have given you Jericho. And he told Gideon, I have given you the Midianites. And so he said that even before they went to battle. And he didn't say, I'm going to give you. He said, I have given you. So that is, God has given us victory already. We just have to walk in. So Gideon divided the 300 men into three companies. So each of the companies had 100 men. And do out of the camp, do as I do. And when I and those with me blow the trumpet, so he had 100 people with him, Gideon did. And then there was a third here and another 100 over here. Mm -hmm. And he said, <clears throat> we, we're all going to we're gonna surround this camp. And when I blow my trumpets, and shout. I want you all to blow your trumpet and shout. And what is it they shout? They said, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. You know, and the same thing happened with, with Jericho. They had the uh, the uh, people with the priests, and they're following the horns, and they, they blew the horns. And they were shouting. I, mean, I don't know what they shouted. I'll say, maybe they shouted hallelujah. hallelujah. You know, but in this That's instance, it. they told them to shout the the sword of the Lord and Gideon. So this is the second encounter where God defeated the enemy with with uh, trumpets and shouting. He doesn't have conventional ways. He didn't have tanks and aircrafts and and uh, bazookas and those kind of things to defeat the enemy, the M16. No. Gideon and his men got to the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle of the white, so when they're changing of the guards and uh, the, of the watchmen, uh, just after the sentries had been posted, they blew the trumpets, and at the same time, they smashed the jars that they carried. All three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars, and they held up the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands, ready to blow and shout it, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now, they were stationed all around the camp, each man at his post. And when the 300 men blew the trumpets, the whole Midianite camp jumped to their feet. God aimed each Midianite sword against his companion all over the camp. In other words, these people, they didn't know what was going on. They saw these lights. They heard this crashing, heard all these horns. They thought they were outnumbered, thought they were all surrounded. They didn't know what was going on. So they just started killing whoever was close to them. <laughs> And they were killing each other. God used the confusion mm -hmm. for them to fight and kill one another. So what better way to win a battle than allow your enemy to destroy themselves? Amen. So they ran for their lives. Gideon and the 300 were outnumbered, but they were victorious. Learn this from Gideon. Let his defeat of Midian be a lesson to you. You may never have to face a rival army, but God can use you to fulfill his purpose. No matter what the fight, no matter what the battle is. Are you fighting a battle that you are afraid you cannot win? A lot of times we may have doubts. Sometimes we may wonder, we may, hey, and what have I gotten myself into? You know, and like I say, it may not be a physical battle. It could be an emotional battle, a mental battle, a spiritual battle. You know, so who are you depending on to get you through it? God or yourself? Sometimes we, we think that, hey, only I can, I got myself into this mess, I'm going to get myself out of it. Sometimes I'm like, I got myself into this mess, God, can you please help me again to get myself out of this mess? Amen. And so the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord. Don't you know that God has never lost a battle? Not one. Not one. So being outnumbered may be because God does not want there to be any confusion as to who the source of the victory, where it lies. God wants you to know that, hey, he did this. So yes, you're going to be outnumbered. Your triumph is only possible because of God. 
You may be a shy person in nature. You may think yourself inadequate to respond to God's calling. The work is not yours alone. It is the Lord's work. And so you are entitled to, to his help. It's the Lord's work. You know, sometimes when you're in ministry, it doesn't go the way you think it, you had it planned out. You know, when I first came to, to plant a church here in Fayetteville, I'm like, especially after the first service, it was a, a dynamic service and full of people. I mean, it was standing room only. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, I was full of myself. <laughs> I'm telling you. And so it, it's not, it don't always be that way, especially after COVID. Churches all over are feeling that everything is declining, that membership and, and people are attending. Oh, I, I, I'm still not comfortable going into these churches with, you know, COVID. You know, was, don't y'all remember COVID? Oh, yeah. I think the clubs are still booming. I think the, <laughs> the sporting events are, are people are overflow. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's, it's a choice. The enemy used that, that thing right there to change your mindset, to give us another excuse. So it is normal for you to feel as though that you are not equipped um, for the call that God has placed on your life. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. I've heard this so, so many times, but although there is no scripture that says these exact words. Because I want to, you know, I like to fact check things. I learned a while back that if I'm going to say something, I need to fact check it. Because I've said things that um, turn out not to be as factual as I've always, because I heard them all the time. I heard so many people say it. So uh, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. You're not going to find that phrase in the scripture. But there are other scriptures that support it. There's the Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. It says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves, and we're not qualified of ourselves, uh, to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. So God's going to qualify those who he, that he has called. I want to um, expound on this with a personal testimony. The part of my calling occurred uh, during an incident that took place in, uh, in my place of employment when I was uh, working. I'm retired now. I like to say the joke, I was tired yesterday and I'm tired today. <laughs> retired. But anyway, no, I'm, I'm, re I'm not working now. I'm retired. Um, and so prior to uh, this incident that took place, God used multiple people to come into my life. In fact, every day for over like a 30-day period, and people would approach me at the gas pump, at the doctor's office, at the grocery store, at the bank, and they would ask, oh, are you a pastor or are you a preacher? I'm like, no, I'm not. And they said, well, you have a calling on your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, even to the point that it, it started to irritate me because I had no desire to be used by God in that capacity. And so what happened is that after God used all those people to kind of get my mind prepared for what he was about to do, one day uh, in time, uh, on the day and time of my encounter, I was at work and I was entering into the elevator. Nobody was in the, in the elevator, so I was entering alone. And I was going from the second floor to the fourth floor. So I was going up two floors. And so when the elevator doors closed, I took this opportunity to take, say to God, Lord, you know, all these people put these titles on me, going to label me as, you know, I have a call on my life. And I said, I would even get frustrated with it. I don't have a call on my life. And I also always say that if God wants me, he literally going to have to call me. And I know that ain't going to happen. And I say, Lord, but I, I guess I can see where that might be a little disrespectful in the way I was handling the situation. And then I said, but Lord, I said, God, I'm not even really into your word, Lord. I said, I don't really read the Bible, Lord. And I said, God, I'm, I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready for you to call me. And that's when God spoke to me and said, I'm not calling you because you're ready. I'm going to ready you because I called you. And I said, when that occurred, it was so overwhelming to me to hear that, that I fell to the floor of the elevator in a fetal position, all knotted up, 
the inside of me was the, the sensation was so overbearing and overwhelming that it was like pain. And I began to cry out to God, Lord, I'm sorry. Please make it stop, Lord. Make it stop. I'm sorry, Lord God. I'll never do that again. Use me as you will. Do with me what you want, Lord. And so I jumped up to my feet, I lifted my arms up, and I started praising God. I started worshiping. And I started just, just telling God that whatever he wants, I will do. And you're like, I'm just bawling. And so it felt like this went on for like 30 minutes or so. And like I said, I only went up two floors. And so I would start wiping the tears from my eyes and, and cleaning myself up. And at that moment, the elevator doors opened up. And I walked out, went back to my desk. Of course, I was no good the rest of that day. But if you want to hear more about that story, you may go to um, my webpage or on YouTube channel, Renewing the Mind, which you can get to through the tm-church.com. Go to the video menu and click on... Um, the YouTube logo, and then go to the the message, God Still Speak, and I'll give you the whole story behind all of that. It's really deep, and it's, I mean, it really goes into how God um, spoke to me in various ways um, throughout that time, preparing me for what he was calling me to do. And that is why no one can change my mind, no matter how uh, alone I feel in this in this journey, and, and to uh, deliver God's message to people. Um, even if I feel like I'm by myself, I'm going to continue to do it. I'm not going to stop because of the experience that I had. And so my aim is to equip people to live a holy and righteous life in this world. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 through 5, it says, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, re rebuke, exhort uh, with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they, uh, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things endure affliction. Do not, I mean, do the works of an uh, evan evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. And so in saying all that in 2 Timothy, Paul is instructing Timothy to preach the gospel, to preach all of it, using it to correct, to rebuke, and to encourage. And he tells him to be prepared for the suffering that will come with well, with his calling. You know, nobody said this is going to be a glamorous thing to be called into. You know, and, and because of why? Because you you carry on. You you're God's spokesperson. You his his ears, his eyes, his his hands, his feet. And so Jesus said the world um, hated him, so he's going to hate you too. And so the world's going to persecute you. Uh, for carrying out the call that God put on your life. And so Paul is telling Timothy that you are to stay clear-minded and to keep going. Don't let anything deter you, from, deter you from, from doing what God has called you to do. So how is this being outnumbered? Not all who say that they are called abide by these instructions. It's, it's a heavy thing. Some people look at uh, being a pastor as a glamorous way to live because that's what some people are doing these days, making it a glamorous way to, to live your life. Uh, so too many uh, in ministry today uh, outnumber those who are true to the calling. The imposters represent the world by representing themselves and the devil even, all while claiming to be servants of God. We're seeking power. Oh, no, let me change that. I'm going to say when I say we, um, <laughs> not me. But there are people who say that they are called and they're seeking fame and power and wealth and notoriety and all that. Mm -hmm. And so they have the lust of um, of the world. You know, so that they, and they may have started off good, but they have lost the faith. They have fallen away. And now they're doing things to promote self. 
and to promote the world and to do things along those lines. And so those who stay true to the faith are outnumbered. They're outnumbered. So these apostles represent these things that are not of God. Sometimes believing and serving God involves so when it seems that no one else is doing so. So we got to keep trusting and keep having faith in God, even if everyone else is, is abandoned ship. You may be outnumbered in doing what God requires. The world may be uh, doing something opposite of what you are doing, opposite of the scripture, opposite of the will of God. So just because everyone is doing it does not make it right. And just because no one is doing it doesn't make it wrong. Sin is sin even when everyone condones it. And righteousness is righteousness even when no one adheres to it. I'm closing with this statement right here, with this comment, the choice is yours. The choice is yours. Are you going to worry about being outnumbered? Because remember, you might be outnumbered, but you're not outdone because you're on God's side. And because you're on God's side, God is on your side. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. I pray that if anyone here who has heard this message, anyone who's listening, hear this, Lord, and I pray that it has encouraged them. I pray that the, this word has given them uh, hope, has allowed them to get back on, on the right path to serve God no matter what. And Lord God, I pray that uh, you will continue to correct them where they need correction, that you will continue to encourage them where they need encouragement. Lord God, we live in a, a world that is, is against you, Lord. They're your enemy. Therefore, let them be our enemy. Let us not try to befriend the world because it's, being a friend of you is what's important. It's what matters. We don't want to meet the fate of the world. We want to have, we want to be like the, the Israelites who kept the faith and without murmuring, complaining, Lord God, to reach the promised land. Everlasting life, eternal life with our Lord and Savior. So Father God, I just pray again that the numbers don't cause us to lose faith. That the numbers, being outnumbered, don't cause us to worry and to believe that that we are not able to succeed let us remember that the battle is not ours it's yours lord and we thank you and we love you for it all in jesus precious name amen, amen. all right well thank you all for joining i hope that this was encouraging for you i pray that uh it was uplifting and um Come join us sometimes if you're able to come to Fayetteville to 115 Cosby Avenue in Fayetteville, Georgia, and fellowship uh, with us. After service, every service, we have Q&A, you know, and that way people get to ask questions, and, and um, we have great conversation, and no, there's no dumb question. Um, everybody get to uh, uplift one another, like I say, testimonies. Are also uh, ministering uh, to one a way to minister to one another. So thank you all for tuning in and look forward to next week. Don't know what the message will be for next week yet, but uh, uh, I guarantee it's going to be a good one. In Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs>